so let me ask if there are any questions about representation. In effect, today what we're going to talk about is rules. What we talked about last time was representing preferences. So I realize I went through that very quickly. Um, you're not responsible for the multidimensional stuff except to recognize that if there's more than one dimension, you cannot generally assume that there's going to exist an equilibrium. So what that means is that there are many possible outcomes of voting procedures. So to review, in one dimension, as long as preferences are single peaked, the median will win. In one dimension, as long as preferences are single peaked, the median will win. In multiple dimensions, even if preferences are single peaked, there's no reason to expect that the median in each direction will win. Well, the question that that raises then is, why don't we see the bridge always fall? And the answer is that rules are either designed or have the effect of solving that problem. So now we turn to rules. We're going to talk about the social choice problem, and there's three problems. One, as we've already established, rules can give the agenda controller the power of a dictator. If I can choose the sequence of votes, I can choose the outcome. But that doesn't seem very democratic. Second, rules <coughs> give voters incentives to misrepresent, which harms the legitimacy of the process. Since they systematically misrepresent their preference as a way of trying to solve the problem of agenda control, people have the sense that the system isn't honest. And third, rules have to control the problem of cycling and dissent. They have to allow dissent and disagreement, but then prevent it from wrecking the system. So one very common way, and I've said this several times, one very common way of solving the problem of dissent is dictatorship. It's not an accident that so many countries around the world and over time have been dictatorships. Because there's problems with democracy that y'all haven't encountered before. Question is, suppose we don't want a dictatorship. What are our choices? Suppose we want to avoid dictatorship. What are our choices? Why has it done that? Sorry. So, the things I'm going to talk about today are impossibility, Arrow's theorem, information and voting processes, how voting processes produce information, the problem of optimal majority rule, an alternative to majority rule, which is called the board account, and approval voting, and a little bit about proportional representation, which many countries around the world use. But the reason we're talking about this is that we've seen that preferences in and of themselves do not imply a determinate outcome. Preferences in and of themselves do not imply a determinate outcome. When we need to choose something as a group, we need to select an outcome. The problem that Lewis and Clark had was they were trying to use rules to choose a determinate outcome, and it didn't work. They didn't get a determinate outcome. Now, they may have been surprised at that, but it's not surprising. In general, preferences do not imply a determinate outcome. The social choice problem has three parts. Deciding how to decide how to decide is the first. That's choosing a constitution. That's constituting yourself in the first place. How do we become a group? We have to choose a group constitution, recognize ourselves as a group, and decide what membership will be. Membership requires both a notion of admission, that is joining the group, and exit. If I know I can't leave the group, I may be less likely to join in the first place. 
If, however, I join voluntarily, I am bound by the rules of the group. That's the essential Rousseauvian answer to the problem of social choice. Remember the question that Rousseau asked, and we quote this in the chapter. Rousseau asked, how can a man be both free and yet bound by wills not his own? How can a man be both free and yet bound by wills not his own? Well, the answer is that if you're trying to choose as a group, a lot of times you're going to disagree with what the group wants. But you are bound by the decision if you agreed to the rules. You're bound to accept the decision or the outcome if you agreed to the rules. Now, you might debate that conclusion. That might not be a correct conclusion, but that is the social contract logic on which many constitutions are based. So for Rousseau, if I live in a country, I am bound by its rules. If I live in a country, I'm bound by its rules. If I don't like the rules, I have to leave. Does that really make sense? Does that mean that we have consent. This is called by philosophers the problem of political authority. The problem of political authority asks, why is it that I owe obedience and that a state has the power of coercion based on some kind of social contract? Am I obliged to obey? And if I disobey, can the state punish me? Well, this was solved for a long time by the divine right of kings, or having your king be actually a living God. If your king is a living God, that solves a bunch of problems with authority. Well, he's a living God. I guess we should do what he says. And it turns out that all of his sons and daughters are living gods also. Most people no longer believe that. We don't believe either that kings or rulers are living gods. And we don't believe that God chose the king. But then, why is it that a ruler has authority over us such that if we disobey, we can be killed and punished? How can our liberties or our lives be taken away if we violate rules we didn't agree to? If I violate a rule I didn't agree to, how can it be that my property can be taken, I can be jailed, or I can be killed. Most of the philosophical theories that democracies rest on take some form of consent. That is, I consented to the rules, but not the outcomes. I consent to the rules, but not the outcomes. The problem, the reason I'm saying that over and over again is that it's so simple, most people don't understand it. Because you could say, well, that's what the majority wants. Well, that's not very persuasive. Majorities often want to abuse minorities. You could say that's what the law says, but that's entirely circular. Why would it be that the law has authority over me unless you say that authority just takes the form of the law? I would need some other justification. Once we have constituted ourselves, and to the extent that this is either legitimate or simply accepted, we have to decide how to decide. Deciding how to decide means we have to choose decision rules. And we have to have a way to change the rules. So the two things that we have to decide how to decide is what rules are we going to choose, and how are we going to change the rules once we have a constitution? So step one is choosing a constitution. Step two is within the constitution, choosing decision rules. And then step three is everyday decisions. Given the rules that we've decided on, we have to choose actually outcomes and policies. All three of these are involved in social choice. All three are involved in social choice. This first step, where a group has to choose a constitution, means that membership in the group means consent to the group's rules, 
which implies the authority. People ought then to keep their promises. Now, you remember why this was important. When we saw the Golden Balls game, we saw the video. Suppose that in that one where both of them had cooperated the whole time and in the last game they both decided to steal, they both got nothing. What would have happened if one of them had cooperated and decided to split? They still would have lost. Problem is that no individual acting alone can solve the problem of cooperation. Which is why Hobbes said, covenants without the sword are but words. Covenants without the sword are but words. So the benefit is we enforce an agreement that we recognize we ourselves might not obey and so might not the other person. Promises by themselves, by this logic, are not enough. Deciding to be a group, membership of the group, might include membership, exit, As I said before, the problem of exit's really difficult. Can I buy my way out? If I leave, do I have to leave all of my wealth? If, exit's, if exit is possible, then residence means consent. But if the justification for coercion, that is for political authority, is actually consent, can we say that any real states are justified? And this famously is from David Hume in his essay on the original contract. Can we seriously say that a poor peasant or artisan has a free choice to leave his country when he knows no foreign language or manners and lives from day to day by the small wages which he acquires? We may as well assert that a man by remaining in a vessel freely consents to the dominion of the master though he was carried on board while asleep and must leap into the ocean and perish the moment he leaves her. So you're taken on while you were asleep, very carefully you wake up, you're 100 miles out at sea, you say, I don't wanna be here, I'm not going to obey your rules, and the captain says, up to you, but then you have to leave. Well, maybe you have to obey because the captain has power over you. But the captain having power over you is a very different thing from saying that the captain has legitimate authority over you. Legitimate authority would have to come from consent, which you did not give. And the fact that you're not exiting doesn't mean that you give consent. The fact that you're not exiting doesn't mean that you're giving consent. So maybe it's true that the state is militarily powerful enough to force you to obey. But that doesn't mean you have an obligation to obey. So I hope you see the distinction that I'm trying to make. We always go back and forth between these two things. One of the reasons many of us obey the state is that they have guns and tanks. That's a really good reason. After all, they have guns and tanks. But usually you want to say something more than that. That is, I am morally obliged to obey the state because the state has authority over me either because I consented formally or because I'm enjoying the benefits that the state provides and if I don't like it, I can leave. Think how often we hear things like that. Anytime someone dissents saying, I wish the United States did something better, it used to be, well, why don't you go to Russia? Now it's often, why don't you go to Northern Europe? If you like Northern Europe so much, why don't you go there? Why don't you go back to wherever. Well, someone can dissent without being told that their only option is exit, except in a dictatorship. In a dictatorship, after all, we need not have, we need not have any of this legitimate authority. Dictatorship solves the problem by transferring sovereignty to an individual. In a democracy, individuals retain sovereignty. That is, in a democracy, individuals choose someone supposedly to serve them. In a dictatorship, the dictator combines sovereignty and rule. In deciding how to decide, we might ask what is a decision rule and how to change rules. 
It happens that I am Duke University's parliamentarian, which means that I am on the Executive Committee of the Arts and Sciences Council, the Faculty Senate, and I advise the chair of that council on the rules. Now, sometimes when we go through a complicated voting procedure, and then it turns out that the result is something that I liked, I assure everyone that's just a coincidence. However, they're rightly suspicious because they know that the rules can determine the outcome. Now think about that for a minute. That's actually really disturbing. Whatever the preferences are, the rules can determine the outcome. Whatever the preferences are, the rules can determine the outcome. What then remains of the moral force of this notion of the will of the people? If the will of the people is contingent, if the will of the people is contingent on the particular rules that are used, and those rules can be manipulated by elites, like me as parliamentarian, that seems disturbing. However, the reason we have rules is that without rules, it would be even more chaotic and it would come down to fighting. So the only two choices we have are fighting or substituting peaceful revolutions in the form of elections. Elections are peaceful revolutions. Elections are a process by which one group can replace another that it doesn't like without fighting. We adopt a set of rules and we have to follow those rules for the election to be legitimate. But if you lose an election, you just have to accept the outcome. Now it's interesting, in 2000, and now that I think of it, of course, in 2000, y'all were three or four years old, so it seems, and in fact is a long time ago, so I might as well be talking about the Eisenhower administration. But still, in 2000, in the United States, we had an election in early November, and it turned out not to have a determinate outcome because the Electoral College votes from the state of Florida were still being contested. Al Gore and George Bush both claimed to have won the state, and the, state was the, the outcome was very close. I had some friends in Russia who sent me emails saying, is there going to be a coup? Why would there be a coup? Well, in Russia, there would be a coup. In Soviet Russia, coup gets you. Well, when you think about it, it was more than a month after the election. We had not established who was going to win the 2000 presidential race. That's really important. Why didn't Bill Clinton just say, you know who's president? I'm president. I have the keys to the tanks. I'm going to declare martial law and we'll settle this. He could have put his vice president, Al Gore, into the position of president claiming a national emergency. He did not do that. We used the rule of law. Now we used the rule of law in kind of a strange way because it came down to a vote in the Supreme Court. What would have happened if the Supreme Court had not, I think we talked about this before, what would have happened if the Supreme Court had not voted five to four in favor of George Bush in 2000? According to the U.S. Constitution, it would have gone to the House of Representatives. House of Representatives would have voted as an electoral body. And since the Republicans had a large majority of the House, George Bush still would have been president. So if we'd followed the rules, George Bush still would have been president. The Supreme Court admittedly kind of short-circuited it. But since we followed the rules, people felt obliged to accept the outcome. What did Al Gore say the day after the Supreme Court announced its decision? Al Gore said, I accept the legitimacy of this result and I congratulate George W. Bush the winner. Even though he lost, he accepted the legitimacy of the result because the rules were followed. So the United States is an institutionalized democracy in the sense that people accept that the rules are more important than persons. What rule of law means is that rules are more important than persons. It takes a long time to get there. If a country's a new democracy, 
often persons are more important than rules. And since rules determine outcomes, that means that people choose rules, which really is tantamount to dictatorship. So the important thing is to ask the circumstances under which rules and not people govern. And it's not easy to get there. Having it written down on a piece of paper doesn't matter because covenants without the sword are but words. So unless the people in charge of the government accept the legitimacy of what's written on the covenant, it's just a parchment barrier, in the words of James Madison. The reason we have rules, this is from Robert's Rules of Order, you want to let the majority have its way and let the minority have its say. Let the majority have its way and let the minority have its say. Problem is that different rules give you different outcomes even with the same preferences. So the general social choice problem is this. We get data on voter preferences. We have some decision rule and some set of alternatives and I drew a circle around those because a lot of times the rules determine both of those things. But this is basically where the rules live, here. How do we decide what the alternatives are and how will we choose among them? And what we want is, as an output, some unique outcome that the people are obliged to obey. It may be easy to get a unique outcome. But we want the rules to take the data that voters provide, that citizens provide, usually in the form of votes, process that by applying it to their ranking of the set of alternatives, use a decision rule to choose one, and that gives us an output. Problem, as we've seen, is that the data that voters provide may depend on the decision rule. So that's called the revelation problem. This first step is called the revelation problem. And we talk about this some in the book. The revelation problem says that the data, the information that voters actually reveal depends on their anticipation of its consequences given the decision rule. And you've seen an example of that in strategic voting. Remember Justin decided to change his vote between apples and broccoli because he knew that the result would be carrots. So he misrepresented, he violated honest revelation. Here's the how do we choose rules problem, and we want to get a unique outcome. Arrow's theorem says that if you want a certain set of ethically desirable properties, you want a certain set of ethically desirable properties, if you get all of those ethically desirable properties, the only decision rule that satisfies those is dictatorship. Democracy, therefore, is always flawed in the sense that at least one of those desirable properties that Arrow lists have to be, satis have to be uh, violated. Dictatorship can solve them, but then it's not a democracy. So the way to think about this We've seen Condorcet's paradox a couple of times. Condorcet's paradox says, basically says, democracy is rock, scissors, paper. A majority is opposed to every alternative. Simple majority rule. But then it's tempting to think there must be some other decision rule that does better. Simple majority rule seems, well, simple. Can't we do better? Arrow generalizes Condorcet's theorem and shows the answer is no. That the indeterminacy that plagues majority rule is also characteristic of any other decision rule you can think of. Now, again in the book we make a distinction between two kinds of problems. One is epistemological. Epistemological problems have to do with knowing. Epistemology is the problem of knowing. Ontology is the problem of being. Ontology is the problem of being. We tend to think of voting as being an epistemological problem. That is, all we need to do is get the correct data and we'll get the correct outcome. That assumes, of course, that there is a correct outcome.
Arrow's theorem shows that the problem is actually ontological. There does not exist. There does not exist a best outcome using voter preferences as data. You can't go from decentralized voter preferences expressed as votes and get a determinate outcome. Now, maybe that doesn't surprise you. Why would groups have preferences when they disagree? Why would groups have preferences when they disagree? Individuals have preferences, and even those may be flawed. People like my colleague Dan Ariely often talks about how consumers are irrational, lack sufficient information to make choices. Well, those idiot consumers don't become geniuses when they enter the voting booth. They have all the same problems of asymmetric information and irrationality, but in addition, they know that their vote doesn't really determine the outcome, so they're free to vote on some basis other than long reflection and study. What Arrow's theorem says is something more fundamental, though, even if voters knew exactly what they wanted and had good reasons, which they don't. But even if they did, the problem has no solution. It's not that some solutions are better than others. The problem has no solution, except dictatorship. So very often, democratic societies become chaotic and snap back to their natural state, which is dictatorship. The alternative is to have a set of rules that people accept as legitimate, usually in the form of some kind of constitution. But it's not easy. This is a difficult thing for a society to achieve. Over and over again, when we see countries try to do it, we see them snap back. The experience in Egypt recently is characteristic. They have an election, they choose a constitution, they have another election, they have a dictatorship. Russia is moving towards dictatorship. The centralization of power is very tempting because of the problems that uninstitutionalized democracies face. When it comes to deciding, the third category, in everyday, in everyday decision making, the context of the constituted group gives you relatively static decision making rules. Now, why is it that so many groups, the relatively static decision making rule that they choose, why is it majority rule? Why is it that so many groups, if they're trying to decide, choose majority rule? Now, we could say it's because of custom, but that's question begging. We do it because we have always done it. Why is it that so many groups independently seem to choose majority rule? Well, I think that question, the answer to it, is what's called optimal majority theory. And I'm going to talk more about it in technical terms in a few minutes. But the simple answer is this. Remember, the question is, why do so many groups use majority rule? That is, n divided by 2 plus 1. If there are seven of us and four of us want something, we'll say OK. The majority is the smallest decisive set such that you cannot pass two contradictory measures. The majority, that is n over 2 plus 1, is the smallest decisive set, such that you cannot pass two simultaneous contradictory measures. Now, if you have three alternatives, you can get a cycle, but you can't go back and forth with two. Obviously, if you had a 40% rule, we could say, all those in favor of A, OK, we choose A. All those in favor of B, OK, we choose B. And A and B are mutually incompatible. So it can't be less than a majority. But why don't people use more than a majority? And the answer is it's expensive. You ever tried to do anything by unanimity rule? We won't do this unless everybody agrees. Well, there's always somebody who disagrees. The closer you are to unanimity, the more expensive it is in terms of time to get there. So you'd like to have the smallest decisive set that you can 
and you'd like not to have to be able to pass two simultaneous contradictory measures. The maximizing or optimal choice given those two imperatives is majority rule, n divided by two plus one, because it's the smallest decisive set saving on decision-making costs that prevents the simultaneous passage of two contradictory measures. But there are quite a few excess rules where it's less than a majority. You can nominate someone with just one. If you're going to introduce a bill, some of you have probably been in high school or elsewhere in meetings that were governed by Robert's rules of order. Someone says, I move that, and then whatever they move. And what does the chair say? Do I have a second? They don't mean I need a break. Can I take a second? What they mean is, will someone second this motion? So it takes two people to nominate something to be considered as a bill or legislation. A writ of certiorari. Writ of certiorari, it's often called granting cert by the Supreme Court. Is it a majority? It is not. Is it unanimity? Is it, it is not. Is it one? It is not. The court decides which cases to take based on the rule of four. Four judges have to vote in favor of considering the, the case. And then when they take the case on, they use majority rule. So at the access point, it takes four out of nine. At the decision point, it takes five out of nine. So we have different decision rules for different procedures. Access rules tend to be smaller than a majority. Decision rules tend to be more than a majority. And rules regarding changing the rules tend to be closer to unanimity. Access rules, small majorities. Well, not majorities, small decisive sets. Decision rules tend to be simple majority. And decisions to change the rules tend to be closer to unanimity. So our procedure for evaluating decision procedures, if we can start with sincere preference orderings, and this is hard, we want to get sincere preference ordering. We can assume that membership is static or and uncontroversial. If not, we have to either make it so or accept the fact that it's not legitimate. So this is a difficult problem. How is it that our membership is established? Then we define the feasible set. Feasible set means these are the things that are allowable. There are some things that are not allowed. Restrictions on religion, restrictions on things that would violate part of the Bill of Rights, those are not allowed, even if a majority wants them. We define criteria for judging decision rules, which is a difficult thing. We can argue about that. We can specify the available set of decision rules, what decision rules are allowable, and then try to use those criteria to select the decision rule. Now, that's sort of the textbook way of going about this. And if you were going to start a new group, you might do something like that. Actual groups tend to use rules in a more evolutionary way. They choose a rule, and then they change the rules when it turns out not to work very well. So in the US, we have a variety of different rules that have evolved over time. Some of them are pretty old, and some of them are relatively new. Well, let's look at an example. And let's suppose we have here in group one, there's 10 people who like A better than B, better than C, better than D. Group two, there's nine people that like A better than C, better than D, better than B. Group three, eight like D better than B, better than C, better than A. Seven people in group four like D better than C, better than A, better than B. So these people disagree. Which alternative overall is best? Well, one way to figure that out is the one that was suggested by the Marquis de Condorcet himself. 
and that is run all the pairwise choices. There's four here, so it would take a little while. The point is that there's 19 people out of 34 who like A best. So if we vote A versus B, it's going to be 19 plus 7 is 26, and so on. So A is better than B, A is better than C, A is better than D. If you conducted all the pairwise votes, is there a cycle here? There is not. In this case, there's one alternative that defeats all other alternatives. We call that the Condorcet winner, if it exists. The Condorcet winner, if it exists, is that alternative which defeats all others in pairwise elections. Here's what Condorcet was working on. Condorcet was worried that if there is a Condorcet winner, the decision rule should choose it. If there's a Condorcet winner, the decision rule should choose it. Now, it seems like any decision rule would, but that's not true. Now, A then is the Condorcet winner because you can convince yourself if you take a few minutes, A beats B, beats C, beats D. But other groups might not be happy if A is always selected. So you might arrange to sometimes select another outcome to share. So this is a problem of majority rule when there is a Condorcet winner, which actually suggests a potential advantage you may not thought of from cycling. If there's cycling, if it's possible for minority groups to win sometimes, you have much more of a sense of shared power. Lonnie Guineer and other political theorists have in fact argued that one way of solving this problem, instead of using majorities, which by definition reward the majority, is to share power more based on proportions in the population. But what you need to have here is the notion of a Condorcet winner. You need to be able to find and to identify, if I give you a table like this, a Condorcet winner. You need to be able to tell me which, if any, of the alternatives is a Condorcet winner. Given a, a table like this, you need to be able to tell me which, if any, is a Condorcet winner. Everybody see how to identify it? You just break it down and do it pairwise. So you can tell that this group, this group, and this group like A better than B. This group likes B better than A. So it's going to be 26 to 8 in favor of A over B, and so on. A defeats all of the other alternatives. Consider a single dimension. Consider a single dimension from left to right. And let's suppose that this is a more or less uniform distribution. That is, there's the same number of voters at every point, and so the number of votes is proportional to the length of the interval that's closest to you. This is the location of candidate B, this is the location of candidate A, this is the location of candidate C. Well, C is going to take all of the votes of people that is clo are closest to her. C's location is here, so C takes everybody over here because C is clearly the closest one. You have voters located all along here. And then C splits the difference with A. People who are closer to A vote for A. People who are closer to C vote for C. Same thing between A and B. This line splits the difference between A and B. So A gets all of those, and B gets all of these. Who's going to win this election? Well, C gets 47 votes, B gets 40, and A gets 13, at least the way that I've drawn it. So I've, I've, it's a, a hundred, vote, hundred voters split evenly along this dimension. Does anybody see a problem with that? 
Well, the problem is A is a Condorcet winner. A is a Condorcet winner, and you can see that by taking C out, just vote A versus B. So we take C out and just vote A versus B. Well, A has a majority. Let's take B out. Well, again, A has a majority. So look at this. Let's go back. A comes in a distant third. A's the candidate in the center and comes in a distant third. Either C or B is certainly going to win, depending on which one happens to be closer to the center. In a majority rule election, in a plurality rule election, the centrist candidate can never win if there's more than two candidates. Even if, if preferences are single peaked. So the median voter theorem only applies if there's two candidates. Median voter theorem doesn't work if there's more than two candidates. This is catastrophic because it means that plurality rule elections will tend to choose candidates who are polarized. You're better off not being in the middle. You're better off being one of the candidates who is not in the middle. The middle always dies. The middle's always torn apart by conflict between the extremes. So if there's more than two voters, the median voter theorem doesn't apply, and the Condorcet winner often comes in last. The Condorcet winner, if it exists, often comes in last. This is basically what Condorcet was worried about. Condorcet's concern was that if we just use plurality rule voting, the best candidates always come in last. If, remember our metric is that political power lies in the center of the distribution of preferences that are enfranchised by the institutions of the society. Well, that's not true if there's more than two candidates. So this is an additional problem. Now, fortunately, we don't have any elections with more than two candidates, right? And they said, well, wait, what about those presidential primaries? Presidential primaries, it seems like there's 12 or six. And that's right. Primary elections, we have many more than two candidates. Is that a good way of choosing? Condorcet, at least, would say no. Because even if there was who would defeat all of the others in pairwise elections, that is, everyone likes this one person, A, better than any of the alternatives, that person has no chance of winning. It's like a poorly designed lottery. The people who win just depend on the positions of the other candidates. It's a poorly designed lottery in the sense that, in a lottery at least, everybody has an equal chance, and you know that you're choosing by, by lot. In this case, you're choosing just based on the positions of the other candidates. You might say, what about majority rule with runoff? Majority rule with runoff means you take the two candidates with the most votes and have them run against each other. So one way you might do it is here, plurality rule. Who wins under plurality rule? Well, C does. What if it's majority rule with runoff? Well, C gets 47, B gets 40, they run against each other, and so you get C gets 56 and B gets 44. A doesn't make it to the runoff. Majority rule with runoff doesn't solve the problem. It's a terrible way of choosing. So I recognize we always go back and forth, as I said a couple of times, between markets and politics. Markets are in many ways a terrible way of choosing. Politics is a really, really terrible way of choosing. So we're left with comparing alternatives between two not very good ways of choosing. Well, a decisive set, and I've used this a couple of times, a decisive set 
is a set of voters who are decisive, that is, they can choose when all of them agree on a decision, regardless of the other group's members' preferences. So suppose there's three of us. If we use majority rule, the decisive set is two. Any two of us is a decisive set. So the two of us could like A better than B, and it doesn't matter if the third person does or not. The third person might like A better than B also, or the third person might not. It doesn't matter because any two of us are decisive. Arrow's paradox can be simply stated, the only choice mechanism that's complete, transitive, and obeys, and obeys Pareto's criterion is dictatorship. Now, Pareto's criterion is unanimity. And we, we discussed this quite a bit more in the book. So it's complete. It allows all comparisons and people are informed. It's transitive in the sense that there are no cycles. It obeys Pareto in the sense that even if people are unanimous, it would still be satisfied. Problem is that those properties seem pretty innocuous. Innocuous means doesn't seem very harmful, but it turns out they're catastrophic. Because the only one that obeys those is dictatorship. If you believe in democracy, that's bad. It means that at least one of those pretty useful and apparently innocuous assumptions has to be violated in the system of government that you're going to pick. And in a way, it's a menu of choice. You have to pick your poison. You have to say the decision rule that we're going to select violates one or the other of these assumptions. So the way Arrow approached this problem was to specify a set of desirable characteristics, determine a set of aggregation mechanisms that have those characteristics, and then show that the only element of that set is dictatorship. So it's a topological proof. He defines things in terms of sets. What are the set of desirable characteristics? Look at the set of aggregation procedures that have those desirable characteristics, and then see how many aggregation procedures satisfy those characteristics. The answer is one, dictatorship. You are not responsible for the details of the proof. You do need to understand its implications. Now, more specifically, the desirable characteristics that he laid out were unanimity, transitivity, unrestricted domain, and independence of irrelevant alternatives. The one that seems most confusing is independence of irrelevant alternatives. It's kind of controversial. I'll say more about that in a, in a few minutes. Non-dictatorship means there is no voter who always gets her way regardless of the other voters. That is, there is no voter such that that voter is a decisive set all by herself. Now, it may mean that if that person is part of a unanimous vote, they still choose it. But if that one person wants A and everybody else wants B, the social choice is not A, which is the definition of dictatorship. The definition of dictatorship is if person one wants A and everybody else wants B, the society still chooses A. So every collective choice mechanism that satisfies the first four characteristics violates the last one. Every decision procedure that satisfies the first four must violate the last. Now, a question was raised last time, and I wanted to try to answer it. And the question was, remember we were looking at those utility functions, we were trying to decide which outcome would be best, and I said the median. And a question was asked, well, why would the median be the best? Because that wouldn't necessarily maximize total utility. There's no reason to think that the median maximizes total utility. What it does is say, if everybody's preferences count the same, one person, one vote, 
the position of the median voter is what majority rule will choose, which is a very different thing. Well, shouldn't we want to maximize utility rather than choose the position of the median voter? It seems like we might. Suppose you had two people who like A a little bit better than B, and one person who really, really likes B better than A. Doesn't it seem odd that we would choose A? But that's the way politics would work. What might we, what might we try instead? Well, there is an alternative to sort of standard elections, which is called interest group pluralism. Interest group pluralism looks at interest groups rather than votes. That is, the political process might be dominated by interest groups rather than votes. Turns out the problem is there's not much hope in that direction either. Arthur Bentley, a physicist in 1908, wrote a book called The Governmental Process in which he looked at what he called vectors of force, and the vector was a combination of the direction and the magnitude, where the magnitude was how much people cared about this outcome. David Truman wrote The Process of Government in 1950. In it, he, ex he extended this idea of interest groups. Let me show you why this may not work. Why is the National Rifle Association such a powerful organization? The reason is that in politics, small but organized groups win. Politics in Washington is about concentrating and focusing power. Large groups have trouble doing that, but small groups focus power very well. The reason is that effective political groups form if individuals think that they benefit by participating. Social scientists call this the free rider problem. Now imagine you belong to a club or fraternity. You have a party. People promise to show up the next day to help clean the house. The free rider problem is that everyone likes having the house cleaned up regardless of whether they help clean it. So who shows up to help clean the house? Mansur Olson, the renowned 20th century economist, identified three factors that will help us predict what happens. First, individual benefits. Not many people enjoy cleaning up the house after a party. Still, in any group, some people always show up for everything. But there aren't enough of those people to solve the problem. The second factor is group size. If there are only six people in your frat, it's easier to get help than if there are a hundred. In a large group, everybody thinks, let someone else do it, I'll just sleep. But if there are only a few members, you know you need to help. The third factor is selective incentives. One word, donuts or maybe sausage biscuits. Some reward that only goes to the people who actually show up and work for the group. What does this have to do with the NRA? Suppose you're opposed to guns and favor stricter gun control laws, but you know the individual benefits to any one person from organizing are very small. Further, if stricter laws are passed, all the supporters win, whether they contribute it or not. There are thousands and thousands of people who think that way. So the potential group size is very large, and it's hard to organize. What about selective incentives? Not much hope there either. If you go to a gun control meeting, all you see is some very earnest people handing out folders and wondering why so few people came to the meeting. Is the NRA different? You bet. Gun rights supporters are not a small group, so group size isn't the reason, but individual benefits are important because NRA members not only like guns, but in many cases actually own guns. So they have something personally at stake in the issue. Furthermore, if you go to a meeting of pro-gun folks, you'll get to see guns, old guns and rare guns. You can join safety classes and marksmanship classes. Even people who might support gun control would enjoy a gun show. These sorts of differences explain a lot about our political system generally. Special interest groups that have focused benefits, relatively small numbers, and the ability to offer selective incentives have disproportionate power. The problem is this means government policy may not be guided by what's best for the public at large. Organized interest groups are able to control a lot of policy making, even if most people in the unorganized public disagree with them. Perhaps that's a reason to be wary of giving the government certain powers in the first place. So the point is that there may not be much hope in that direction either. We'd like to think 
that interest groups could balance out the problems with majority rule. The problem is that groups are not all equally likely to form. And the problem that Mansur Olson talked about with the logic of collective action is that that means that groups that have concentrated economic benefits and diffuse costs over the entire population are likely to dominate the political process. So if you were to ask, do most people in the United States prefer increased gun control laws? Yes. Why don't we have increased gun control laws? Well, it's because organized interest groups can dominate even majority rule. So even as flawed as majority rule is, in some ways it might be better to the sort of crony relationships that we see from interest groups. So I'm sorry, today was a pretty depressing lecture. On Wednesday, we have the next outside speaker, and he's a very uplifting fellow. See you then. <laughs>